fast meeting. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. I know that we are conflicting with another space event that's happening on the site, um, but hopefully this will be our last time we conflict with another mm -hmm. organization. But anyway. Um, also, I would like to announce that we will have a social gathering on February 17th at 7 uh, in Fox and Fidel, downtown. Uh, the address and all the information will be provided on the website shortly. Uh, I would like to um, introduce Kazet. Uh, he's, he's the president of SETS Canada and he has an announcement as well. Thank you, Shai. Hey everyone, my name is Kazet. So, two general announcements. Some of you may know that uh, the Canadian Space Commerce Association is having their first Canadian Small Sat Symposium next week. Uh, to the students in the room, and if anyone else knows interested students, I'm looking for volunteers to sign up for the event. So just let me know if you're interested. I'm going to leave a few business cards over there. You can just pick it up and get in touch with me. Uh, secondly, my organization, Students for the Exploration and Development Space, uh, SATS Canada, uh, of which Gary is a as well. We're putting together an event uh, on the first weekend of March, our first uh, conference hosted by the Space Society of London at Western. So if you want to hear more about that, uh, take my business card as well. Thanks. Thank you, Kazak. Um, I would like to introduce uh, the speaker, Eric uh, Boyd. He's a graduate from Queen University. Um, he worked with uh, Silicon Valley in a high-tech uh, company as well as he was the co-founder of StumbleUpon.com uh, as well as uh, the founder of SenseBridge and he is right now the president of Hack Lab Toronto so please without any further ado, Eric Coy. Um, so this, this is a fairly long talk, I think I'll just get into it. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, this is a quick overview, but uh, basically I discovered this idea um, maybe six months ago myself on Quora. Somebody had provided an answer, it was a question about Mars colonization, and somebody wrote back with like a 30,000 word answer saying we should colonize Venus instead. And from there, I basically just started looking around. So the first thing is, like I said, it's not my idea. And then I'll go over some basics of Venus talk about why we think it might actually be habitable, and then all kinds of stuff about what we would do in order to go there, and the kinds of research we need, and why we need a Venus Society. <coughs> so um, this Venus stuff really got started because of this gentleman who works at NASA in the um, uh, Glenn Research Center. I believe he still works there now. He wrote a paper for a conference in 2003 talking about the colonization of Venus and presented basically all of the ideas that I'm going to present now. And since then, the ball has sort of slowly been rolling faster and faster on Venus. And now, there's all kinds of stuff out there. So there's a really great article you can check about on Vice um, in their motherboard section. There's a really cool video that PBS Digital Studios made that has three quarters of a million views, which is pretty incredible. This is like a seven minute version of my talk and he's got like fancy illustrations and graphics. Oh yeah, it's high tech. Um, <clears throat> and then I discovered there's all kinds of historical stuff too. It turns out the Russians were dreaming of Venus colonization in the 70s and early 80s because they were having a lot of success with Venus missions, something like two thirds of all of the missions that have gone to Venus were Russian missions. And this is like a picture from one of their journals of how they think it might happen with the gigantic like dome that contains enough air to level the rest of the structure. And you can see they've got like the classic Russian style gigantic turboprop aircraft. <laughs> and the whole thing appears to be made out of concrete. <laughs> um, NASA has projects now too. This is one with a poorly chosen acronym, HAVOC. Um, but basically the idea is the same. These gigantic floating pods just above the cloud deck of Venus. And Northrop Grumman, the gigantic defense contractor that does a lot of space stuff, they also have a plan called VAMP, which is a slightly better acronym. Um, and it's, this aircraft is actually relatively small and it's just basically like a floating science station. But I talked to the gentleman behind this, they also have dreams of like, you could just make it bigger. <laughs> so there's lots of stuff out there. But let's go back to the beginning of the story. Um, 
the beginning of the story really starts at the dawn of recorded history. Venus is the brightest object in the night sky other than the moon. So this is actually a shot from my cottage up near Huntsville. That's the moon. This is Venus. Now it is Saturn. And uh, Venus can always be seen in the mornings and evenings. You can't see it in the middle of the night when it's totally dark because Venus is actually closer to the sun than the Earth. And what that means is the, the only times, like the, the sight line to Venus from Earth always basically includes the sun as well, very close. You never get a shot of Venus when it's like this way, the way we get shots of Mars. And this complicates astronomy, like actually looking at Venus with a telescope is very complex because there's only like an hour window when it's not, you know, blocked by the sun. And it moves around in the sky in the early morning and in the uh, late evening. Um, but the other interesting thing about this view of our solar system is it shows how much closer to Earth Venus is than Mars. So you can see this is the distance to Venus, and there's a much larger distance to Mars, plus Mars has this weird eccentric orbit. And so you can get to Venus in five months instead of seven to nine months, and your launch windows, if you do the Hallman transfer orbits, happen on a much more regular basis because Venus is circling around so much faster. You have more opportunities of doing the low transfer, low energy transfer orbit. So it's easier to get to and quicker. That's one of the reasons it would be a better target. Um, more basic facts about Venus. It has almost the same mass and therefore gravity as Earth does, about 0.9 g's. There's no moon in its sky. Um, it is, as I said before, closer to um, the Earth than Mars, and it's constantly cloudy. In fact, that is um, the, the, like, the most important fact about Venus from the perspective of history. Um, one reason it's super bright in our sky is not just that it's um, closer to Earth and bigger than Mars, but also that the cloud deck reflects almost all of the light that hits Venus. So it ends up being very bright in the sky, and also it totally obscures the surface. So for much of the history of humanity, nobody has known what Venus looked like. And until the 70s and 80s when we sent spacecraft there with radar, we didn't know what the surface looked like either. Um, its year is slightly shorter than that of Earth. And its day, now that we know what the planet underneath actually looks like, we discovered that it hardly rotates. It rotates only slightly slower than the planet orbits the sun. And so its day is like half the length of its year which if you were going to live on the surface would obviously be a bad situation. Um, but in fact, living on the surface is a really bad situation in like basically every way. Um, there's an absolutely enormous atmosphere, 93 times as much air pressure at, at uh, the surface as we have here on Earth, which is like being a kilometer under the ocean. Um, the surface temperature is 462 degrees Celsius. This seems, this seems oddly precise to you, it's because actually the surface is unbelievably uniform down there. According to everything we can measure, there's basically no wind at the surface, and the temperature is constant year-round, day and night. It doesn't matter where you are. It's always exactly the same, which is kind of odd. Um, the other thing that is a little bit inhospitable is there are um, sulfuric acid clouds that are caused by the active volcanism on Venus. So there's lots of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. This is one of the things that we will have to deal with. And this is one of only two photos in existence of what the surface of Venus might actually look like. The Russians sent um, a whole bunch of landers, in, starting in the um, late 60s until the early 80s. Um, the first five of them imploded on the way down because they had no idea how deep the atmosphere was. And so they kept designing new ones, each of which was stronger than the last. And they're like, this one's going to make it. And <laughs> five attempts before they actually got down there, and then it lasted two minutes on the surface before it too imploded. Um, apparently, one of, the, one of the really interesting stories from the early missions is they actually had um, pewter casts of um, Stalin inside one of the, the first two aircraft. Pewter is actually, um, its muting, melting point is so low that now there are actually puddles on the surface of Venus. <laughs> Well, that makes a fun story. <laughs> Melted statues of Stalin. Huzzah. <laughs> uh, so, like I said, there's this absolutely enormous atmosphere. It's um, much, much taller than that on Earth. And um, the interesting place is up in the cloud decks. There's uh, miles and miles and miles of clear air down here. 
and then there's three different cloud decks. The, the lowest deck is kind of what we would normally think of as clouds. They have roughly the same particle size here on Earth, the same kind of visibility, and they're quite thick. And then there's two layers of clouds that are more like a mist. So the middle cloud deck is like kind of a, a fine mist. Visibility would be something like one to two kilometers. And the upper clouds are um, really quite transparent. They're hardly clouds at all. But apparently the visibility would be something like 10 kilometers. You would see quite a long ways in upper cloud decks. Um, there's all kinds of mysteries that scientists are super curious about. Um, one of the recent Venus projects that NASA is evaluating for a possible mission in the near future is basically to study the atmosphere some more. There's all kinds of puzzles, some of which I'll go over today. But from the perspective of this talk, what we really care about is habitability. So I have this wonderful chart which really summarizes why I think Venus is a cool target. It's from, it was published in Nature just a couple of years ago, and it shows the atmospheric temperature and pressure of every planet in our system, except it didn't even show Mars, because Mars basically has no atmosphere to first order. Um, I added a line where I think the Mars atmosphere should be, but that's just my guess. The scientists have more exact things. That's why my line looks so straight. I'm not exactly sure. But basically, there's no atmosphere on Mars. And then when you look down here in the place that we care about, which is like basically one bar and basically like you know, zero degrees to like 25 degrees C, it's in here. I've drawn this circle, which is like kind of the zone where humans are actually physically comfortable. And there's really, it's obvious there's only two planets in this zone. One is Earth, and the other one is Venus. And nothing else even comes close. So like Jupiter, much too cold. Mars, no atmosphere at all. And then there's like, you know, the ice giants, which are even colder yet. So the only hope of finding a place in our solar system where we can have an atmosphere that's at the pressure and temperature we like on Venus. And in fact, the Russians had a mission in 1985, just before their collapse, where they sent some balloons that kind of like hung out in the cool spot on Venus, um, 53.6 kilometers up in the atmosphere at a pressure of half of Earth's atmosphere. And the temperature was 27 to 37 degrees C while they kind of floated around. And you know they took a bunch of samples. Um, the probe was designed only to last um, in the daylight, and once it fell into darkness, it had no power, and they never they lost track of it. So you know they got a few hours basically of data, but it, it's a proof of principle for the kind of thing that I'm talking about today, which is buoyancy. So as it turns out, the uh, Venus atmosphere is made almost exclusively of carbon dioxide, 96.5 percent CO2. And CO2 is a very heavy gas. Um, if you do some math about buoyancy, on Earth, you can take a helium balloon, and the difference in the molar mass between the helium and the air tells you how much buoyancy you get. So basically, you, you can lift 21 grams per mole of gas. A mole of gas at STP is about 20 liters, give or take, which is like you know, this big. So like your typical balloon that you inflate is maybe half a mole, and therefore you get maybe 10 grams of lift. And you just have to like multiply that out to a big enough balloon, and you can do things like these people are doing where you can float around in your lawn chair, high above the earth, and then hopefully you have some way of getting down. <laughs> it's not exactly clear to me Without how you recover from them. that situation. <laughs> Without popping them. Without, yeah, well, I suspect you probably do have to pop some of them. That's probably no, the, the, the lattice of, um, a balloon, latex balloon, is is larger than the lat latex, uh, uh, the lattice of a of the helium. Uh -huh. So eventually migrates uh, after right. eight hours. Yeah. Unless you line the balloon. Oh yeah, yeah no, but you line some of the balloons, and, and you have and some of them that would line. migrate, so it would lower slowly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably how they do it. There's lots of other ways they could pop them too. Um, but um, the other calculation that's shown here is CO2, which is the Venus atmosphere is made of, minus air, which we would breathe, and you have almost the same lifting capacity as a helium balloon on Earth, just about um, three quarters of the value. So basically, you have to imagine, on Venus, there's like it's this atmosphere you can't breathe that's made of mostly CO2, and then you have gigantic balloon, which you are inside, and it provides the buoyancy to lift you up. And you're, you know, constructing your living quarters inside or whatever. That's the whole idea. 
Um, um, one of the things I said earlier was the day on Venus is 112 Earth days, super long. So you'd be in the sun for 112 days and then in the darkness for 112 days, which obviously would not work in terms of like growing crops or even staying sane for that matter. Um, but as it turns out, the atmosphere has a thing which scientists have not yet figured out why it does this. Nobody understands why super rotation happens on Venus. But um, what the phenomena is, is the winds on Venus are like whirling around the planet at super high speeds. As you can see over here, 350 kilometers per hour, they're whirling around Venus continuously. And if you do the calculation, this makes the day, if you're like hanging out in the atmosphere, you're floating along with it, it makes the day about 96 hours long. So you have 48 hours of sunlight and then 48 hours of darkness, which is about double what we have here. Obviously, you would like sleep some during the day and then sleep more during the night, I don't know. But I'm confident you could make that work. Um, the, other, the other weird quirk which scientists don't understand too is it's been speeding up like a lot. Since they started doing the measurements in 2006, it's gone from 300 to like 360 or so. Nobody knows why. Nobody knows why it does it in the first place. But it clearly, if you're in a colony like this on Venus, the length of the day is actually going to change depending on how fast the winds are going. So uh, <laughs> that would be something to get used to. What's, is, there, is, there, is there a circulation there from like the equator on there? Are there similar sort of circulation like the Hadley cells on Earth yep. or not? There are also Hadley cells, and they basically like superimpose on top of this global circulation that they call super rotation. So I do have a chart later that you'll see showing the Hadley cells and talking about like, you, if you're actually going to have a floating colony, you need to find either a stable pattern of moving in these Hadley cells or some kind of like stable position because you don't want to just be randomly roving around. Hmm. I have a, a follow-up question after this. I read recently that uh, Mars um, has lost its atmosphere because of um, uh, solar wind or whatever. Mm -hmm. S since Venus has a very thick atmosphere and is much closer to the sun, does it actually have like a comet tail of material uh, leaving of the planet? Um, yes. It does? Yes. So actually there's been a couple of really great things recently where they've been studying um, the ablation of the Venus atmosphere and especially the water in it due to coronal mass ejections and similar events from the sun. It is losing some, but I think mostly because Venus is so much heavier, it's harder for it to lose its atmosphere in the same way that happens on Mars. Although, again, there's open scientific questions about exactly why Venus has managed to keep as much of its atmosphere as it has compared to Mars. Yeah, nobody's really sure. Um, the other thing that, in my opinion, makes Venus a lot more habitable than Mars is radiation protection. So on Mars, well, maybe before, maybe before I talk about that, I'll talk about the sources of radiation. They're basically three major problems to deal with in terms of radiation space. The first is shown here. These are um, like artist renditions of what happens when a galactic cosmic ray hits the um, atmosphere of Earth. So these are extremely energetic particles that come from all over the known universe, other galaxies, inside our own galaxy, and so on. They come in at hundreds of thousands of kilometers per hour, and they just make this like massive splashing thing of particles which reach the surface and cause um, radiation exposure for you. Down here at um, near sea level, it actually only is a few percent of your radiation exposure. But if you go higher, when you go, um, if you live in Denver or if you take, you get on airplanes, your radiation exposure basically um, goes up with like the... Uh, exponential. Yeah, exponential. Exponential. So in space, galactic cosmic rays, because they move so fast, when they do hit you, they cause an enormous amount of damage. And they are the major cause of um, problems in space. And they're also basically impossible to block. If you're in a spacecraft, you need something like 20 feet of shielding to effectively protect you from galactic cosmic rays. And we simply cannot afford that level of shielding. So um, one of the stories that um, isn't well known, well, I'll get, I'll get to that. but. The, the, other, the other major source of radiation is the sun. Um, there's a continuous stream of particles from the sun that's called the solar wind, which causes low levels of radiation exposure. Um, they're relatively tolerable. You can block them with just a centimeter of material. But the other thing the sun does is shown here. It does these um, 
um, things called sonal, solar coronal mass ejections, where basically it like shoots out an enormous amount of material. I think actually I have a shot. Yeah. This is a shot from NASA's SOHO Observatory. Sadly, I couldn't figure out how to get it to repeat, but you can see here there's this enormous amount, like this plume of material that comes off. And it, um, it is actually composed of like atomic nucleuses, many of them quite heavy, and um, they move relatively slowly. It takes several days for that material to get from the sun to the earth. And um, when those land, they do like an absolutely tremendous amount of damage. They're relatively high particles, they're relatively high energy particles, they move relatively fast. Um, they can be shielded against, you need about 10 centimeters of material in order to block them. So um, commonly, um, you know, you, you, we can have that on spacecraft, you can shield against this kind of thing. Um, but um, really interesting anecdote, they did not shield against it during the Apollo missions to the moon. If there had been a solar coronal mass ejection during any of the moon missions, once they're outside of the um, protective magnetic field that the Earth emits, or the Earth has around it, um, the astronauts were exposed. If there had been an event, we could actually have lost astronauts to radiation sickness, like quickly. If there's enough radiation in these, you would die in several days. So people dodged a bullet. They knew they were taking that risk at the time. They took it. It paid off. <laughs> but <laughs> we wouldn't want to take that. Um, and this is the kind of thing that um, causes big problems on Mars. You need shielding. You don't want to be out and about. But on Venus, this is not a problem. The solar wind is not a problem. And even if you're deep enough, the galactic cosmic rays are also not a problem. You need to be probably deeper than 500 um, millibars. You probably need to be 700 or 800 to start getting down that exponential curve. But as long as we can be deep enough, we can be protected without doing anything special in our habitats. What's making, on the other one, what's making the, the ray break up on the Earth one? This one? Yeah. Yeah, what happens is the, the ray comes in and it hits you know, a couple of particles in the upper atmosphere, which then start moving at intense velocities, and then they hit oh, other right. particles, and then they hit other particles. So that by the time it gets to the surface, there's tens of thousands of particles, most of which are moving relatively slowly now, and it still hurts you, but only just a tiny bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and like I said, if you're deep enough in the Venus atmosphere, you can achieve a similar effect. But on Mars, basically, you know, you're like here, and so the atmosphere isn't doing a lot of good for you. So it's just because in the Earth's atmosphere there's so many odd particles that stuff. Yeah, there's so much mass above you. Chain reaction. The, the mass above you in the atmosphere, actually they, they have a calculation, Mars 1, says about 5 meters of material is the equivalent of the, the amount of atmosphere above you. Like if you piled it up as, you yeah. know, like a stone or whatever. So that's their plan. The Mars 1 plan is basically bury all of the habitats in 16 feet of stuff and then only go out two hours a day because every time you're out on the surface, you're being exposed to these galactic cosmic rays. You're being exposed to those solar coronal mass ejections. You're being exposed to the solar wind. And then they have this diagram which illustrates the supposed safety of their colonies on Mars. But I frankly find this diagram terrifying. So this, this is you in red, right? You get on the spacecraft. In space, you're exposed to galactic cosmic rays. No way to shield against it. You accumulate like a half a, a, of a, a siever of radiation. And then once you're on the surface with this, you spend two hours a day outside, you get 22 millisieverts per year, which adds up surprisingly fast. And by the end of your life, you're approaching one sievert of radiation. And I don't, do I have a slide on it here? Yeah, here you go. One sievert of radiation, I looked this up. If you receive one sievert of radiation, your odds of getting cancer in your lifetime go from 41 out of 100, 41%, to 61 out of 100. And, of course, right now about half of all cancers you receive are fatal. Um, if you are on Mars, a lot more than half are going to be fatal because you're going to be lacking modern medical health care, right? <laughs> so, basically on Mars, <laughs> you're going to have cancer. That, that's what that comes to. Even, even though they think this diagram shows that like you're safe, I am not convinced. This is terrifying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, I'm sure they'll find people that are willing to take this risk, but... Why was there a difference between men and women? Um, do you know? No, I imagine that it has to do with, um, like, giving birth, and the chance that you would give birth to things with genetic defects or something, but I'm actually not sure. Um, 
the, the other possibility that is probably playing into this somewhat is the amount of mass that you have. So men have much higher um, body weight, and lots of cells are unimportant, right? So like skin cells, all kinds of things. So it's possible that just because you have more mass, you get hit roughly the same amount, but you're distributing it more finely. I don't know. The bones it's, are more dense as well. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know exactly what the difference is, but it is quite large. I mean, it looks like it's nearly a factor of two. Uh, so um, that ends my section on radiation, where basically my point is Venus provides better radiation protection than Mars, or in fact than any other place we could be in the solar system, because uh, the moon has much the same kind of problems as Venus does, or as Mars does, rather. Um, the other thing that makes Venus an interesting colonization target is the atmosphere actually has a lot of the things that we really want. So it's got uh, water at 20 parts per million. It's got um, other sources of hydrogen and oxygen. And of course, it's got lots of carbon dioxide. And so in my opinion, the way that a colony on Venus works is you have a bunch of synthetic biology, genetic engineered organisms, which are taking elements out of the atmosphere and turning them into things that you want. Your primary building materials are probably wood, plastic, and um, you're basically like mining the atmosphere for the things that you want. So um, I put this in, in here for perspective as well, because 20 parts per million doesn't sound like a lot of water, but 52 parts per million CO2 is basically all of the atmosphere on Mars. So that tells you already that like the amount of water just in the atmosphere on Venus is equivalent to half of the entire Martian atmosphere, which is a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the other thing that makes Venus really compelling is even 50 odd kilometers up in the atmosphere, you basically have 99% of the Venus gravity, which is itself 90% of the gravity on Earth. And so you do not have to worry about any of the kind of um, low gravity, microgravity problems that people are anticipating we might have on the Moon or on Mars. No one knows for sure whether 31% gravity on Mars will cause us problems. Um, we have reasons to be suspicious given the incredible problems that astronauts have with long-term exposure to zero gravity, but we would not have to worry about it on Venus. You would basically feel just slightly lighter on your feet on Venus, which would be awesome. Um, sadly, you couldn't play zero G music like Chris Hatfield, but we can do that on a trip there. Um, so, <clears throat> that kind of ends the section about what Venus has. Um, the other important thing about colonizing Venus is all of the other things that we would need. So there's many kinds of technologies that we're going to need if we're ever going to colonize Venus. The first one is some ability to build like really gigantic airships. And Lockheed Martin has been working on these kinds of things for the military, where they're like basically trying to like carry loads. So I think this thing actually is designed to lift up tanks and kind of like cover them along. They had a really great event uh, about 18 months ago where one of these somehow managed to unmoor itself from where it was docked, and it like it had the it actually was trailing these like gigantic anchors, and it basically dragged these gigantic anchors and their huge chains like ten kilometers across the landscape, just ripping up everything in its path, including power lines and all kinds of stuff, before they managed to like get it back under control. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> what size is that? Um, Any it, idea? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't think it's actually all that big. Uh, I think it's only like 500 feet long and a couple hundred feet wide and maybe 100 feet high. It's still big, but it's it's only big on the scale of like a 747. It's not truly enormous. Is that missing something or is there no shadow? Uh, yeah, it's probably under us somehow. Yeah, it I mean, looks you like can't see. It looks like it looks like yeah, maybe it's an artist wondering. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, they do have these in real life, like I said, much from God Luke's, <laughs> even if this is a rendering. Um, the other thing we're going to need, which we totally have no grasp on, is um, something like Arcology. So this is a shot from SimCity 2000, if anybody played that. Wonderfully fun game. But basically an Arcology is like a um, self-contained, self-sustaining ecosystem. So we need to have an understanding of how to process the air, the water, and you know whatever soils and plants we have in a way that makes everything closed loop and self-sustaining without regular injections of help from the outside world because you're going to be on Venus. It's five months from the Earth at minimum. Um, and we have done some interesting experiments on Earth on this front. If anybody's familiar with the Biosphere 2 project, 
it was kind of interesting. It was it was basically a failure, but they learned a lot. And um, I have a very cool book to recommend if you like science fiction books. This one, The Water Knife by Paolo um, Bagalupovi, is wonderful. It's set in the southwestern United States, um, Nevada, California, Arizona, um, New Mexico, that kind of area. And basically, due to climate change, the whole area has become unbelievably dry and arid. And in order to survive there, the Chinese are uh, being contracted to build these gigantic arcologies, which reclaim all of the water that people breathe out and everything like that, so that the people who live inside them don't have to import any more water, because importing water in that area just becomes prohibitively expensive. So really interesting read. Um, there's lots of like futuristic violence and all kinds of good stories. <laughs> um, but that's kind of an aside. The technology we need is the arcology, like self-sustained ecosystems. Um, the other thing, um, this is one of uh, the projects that I follow, it's called the Seasteading Institute. Their idea basically is this like libertarian dream of having creating a new country by basically creating land that floats out in the ocean. And this is an illustration of one of the things they commissioned. It's a um, modularly expandable sea colony. And I think that on Venus we're going to need a similar idea of the modularity of colonies and the way that they could like sort of grow organically over time and you know how you're going to add new modules, how are you going to interface with the ships that are kind of going to come down from space, how are you going to talk with other colonies that might be floating in the clouds of Venus. All this kinds of thinking about like when you don't you know when you don't have land around you and you can't just erect a new house and move the fences up a little bit, how is it that you expand? This idea is going to be absolutely key if we're going to colonize Venus. And it requires some very clever design thinking. This is an example on a C. We would have to come up with examples in the sky. Um, um, the other really important thing, this is again a shot from Havoc, the NASA project, the really unfortunate acronym. But they actually designed a whole series of spacecrafts to support their idea of having these big balloons floating around in the skies of Venus. And um, we do need, basically, these are their idea of spaceships. You'll notice how much less photogenic they are than the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> Hopefully we can do better. <laughs> but we're going to need spacecraft. Um, I actually saw a really interesting proposal. NASA ran a contest um, last year for ideas on how to get rid of that radiation exposure during the journey from Earth to Mars. And somebody proposed a really interesting idea of having a, basically a radiation shield that would be in some kind of elliptical orbit from the Earth to Mars and back, and that your spacecrafts would basically just like merge with that shield, follow it along, and then unmerge. And that would be one interesting way of getting around the radiation problem. And it's the kind of example, this, this mobile radiation shield in orbit would be an example of a big spacecraft, because it could have things other than the shielding, of course. It could have much more expansive living quarters and all kinds of things, because it is the kind of thing that's going to be used over and over again if you're going to make colony on Venus, you're going to go not once, not twice, but dozens or hundreds of times. And it would pay off to have that kind of thing in your transfer orbit. Um, the other thing, um, anybody recognize this? Yeah, this is a famous, yeah, this is a famous mission from, was it last year or maybe two years ago? Um, yeah. Or whatever. yeah, so this is the um, asteroid that they um, tried to land on just a couple of years ago. And this is a shot from the approach. Um, basically, what we need on Mars is all the things that are not, or on Venus, what we need is all the things that are not in the Venus atmosphere, which is basically like metals, silicates, and um, other um, vitamins. By vitamins, I mean what space people mean by vitamins, which is things you can't make in your colony. So vitamins would be like microprocessors and other things like that. Um, but one way of obtaining these materials, rather than importing them from Earth, would be to find a near Venus object, some kind of asteroid or comet that regularly crosses the orbit of Venus and has a low delta V to Venus orbit, and capture it and put it into Venus orbit, and then basically use that as a Venus space station where you would mine your metals, you would do your smelting, you would do all the kinds of things that you don't want to do in your colony anyway, in order to obtain the things you can't get from the Venus atmosphere. Obviously, this would be a big project, but colonizing Venus is a big project already. This is just like a little side effort. <laughs> They, they did manage to land on that, didn't they? They did actually yeah. land on it, yes. And they ended up somewhere, I think they ended up in one of these like valleys where the radios couldn't talk, right? Yeah. And that was the big problem. 
Yeah, that was a great mission. Hope they do more like that. Uh, so, now we get into the section where I talk about all the things that can make this never happen, of which, of course, there's a huge number, but I only have a few. Um, probably the most critical is this temperature, pressure, buoyancy trade-off. So, where we really want to be is one Earth atmosphere at like maybe 0 to 10 degrees Celsius. Your colony is going to generate heat because the sun is landing on it, so you want the surroundings to be a little bit colder than humans are actually comfortable with so you can reject heat. But on Venus, the one atmosphere level is actually at about a 70 or 80 degrees Celsius, which is much too hot. And so the obvious solution is just to like move up a bit where it's colder. But the problem with moving up is, A, you get more radiation exposure, and B, your buoyancy starts becoming harder and harder. You, you are as buoyant, but the, because your pressures are going down, the amount of buoyancy you get per volume goes lower and lower. So like if you're at half an Earth atmosphere, you have basically exactly half the buoyancy per given volume as you would have had. And so it's conceivable to me if we can't find a way to make this trade-off work in a way that we like, the Venus colonization becomes impossible. Um, my big hope on this one is to find areas of Venus that are cold. So maybe the colony hangs out near the north or south poles, where the temperatures are a little bit colder. Or maybe you find some kind of jet stream that's colder, or like some other detail like this. Um, the other possibility is we could just try to like geoengineer Venus. All we have to do is you know, cool it a few degrees. So maybe you erect some like gigantic mirrors that reflect away some of the sunlight, and you wait 50 years, and Venus gets a little bit colder. <laughs> Or some other like crazy scheme, but this is definitely something that could, could totally stop the colony from happening. If you can't find a way to get to a comfortable place where you have the pressure that you like, the protection you need from radiation, the buoyancy you want, and a temperature that doesn't cause you to need air conditioning uh, like 24/7. Um, the other major problem is what I term climate here. Um, this is the Hadley cell um, slide that I was referring to earlier. So. Um, what's not shown here, this, this little arrow is meant to indicate the um, um, uh, global rotation, super rotation of all the gas. And then the Hadley cells are kind of superimposed on that. They rotate up and down like this. And so what you want for your colony is to kind of find a place where you can hang out at the altitude that you like without ending up in a place where um, you know, you're going to be subjected to all kinds of nasty weather or whatever. So like when, when these Hadley cells run into each other, this will be a place of absolutely intense turbulence where the air is like just changing paths. And so you don't want to be like hanging out on these Hadley rotation cells and running into those on a regular basis. What you want is something more like this zone where there's like a little zone of stability. Or possibly you can just find an altitude where the Hadley cells are not operating and hang out in those. Um, the other possibility is um, maybe your colony is capable of moving at some steady speed. You know, you can move it, you know, 20 or 30 um, kilometers per hour or whatever by using some power. And maybe you can just, like, fight this current. You can just, like, hang out. But um, regardless of what your solution is, you, we need to find a stable path. And if you can't find such a stable path, this idea of being a cloud city is a total non-starter. Because if you get blown into, you know, these polar vortexes, or this zone where the Hadley cells are colliding, or any other place where the climate has a regular kind of event, kind of like, like the giant red spot on Jupiter, that kind of thing is going to be the death of you, because your colony can't possibly be built strong enough to maintain itself against the kind of storms that Venus is capable of. I suspect because the atmosphere is 100 times as big as Earth, that the possible storms are 100 times as big as those on Earth. <laughs> Which is my next slide. <laughs> Just before you go to the bay, uh -huh. the is that the actual measured Hadley cell, or is that sort of what they presume they're going to be? Um, so they because you've got two levels of Hadley cell there. Yeah. And I'm just wondering why they came up with that. And the other thing is the uh, what you call the polar collar. Is that the equivalent of the feral cell on Earth or not? Because at that point you start getting um, Rossby waves. Yeah. So you clearly know more about atmospheric dynamics than I do. Um, I believe that this is the um, so-called model Venus atmosphere. Scientists have been doing a lot of basically climate modeling for Venus and figuring out from what little data they have from satellites and probes 
what the structure of the Venus atmosphere is on the, on the biggest level. And this like reflects that as far as I know. But there are, uh, as with a lot of things on Venus, there's a lot of things that scientists don't understand and don't know and simply don't have any data for. So, I mean, I mean, the very fact that they don't know what causes the super rotation tells you what the level of like atmospheric science is on Venus. If you can't understand the largest phenomena that's happening, <laughs> your, your science thinks help. Um, would it be possible that there's super fast particles in orbit in the clouds causing stirring? Possible? I have no idea. All right, we move on. Where could I look that up? Anywhere where I could look that up? Or? Yeah, if you look up um, Venus Atmosphere, you just type that in Google, there's actually oh. a really excellent Wikipedia page oh, really? from which I believe actually this diagram is taken. And then um, also, like I said, scientists, about every three years, they release a new version of what they call the Model Venus Atmosphere. It's like a, a, a simulation engine which they're developing to try to understand the Venus Atmosphere, and it's all open source, and you can go nuts. Yeah, it's just blown my mind out. You've got a, you've got an outer Hadley cell that's circulating from, you know, the equator to the other equator. It sort of doesn't make any sense to yeah. me. Yeah, how I they mean, evolved with it, you know. I don't know enough about it to even comment on that, but I can say that the the Venus atmosphere is so absolutely enormous compared to that that we have on Earth that there's room for a lot of things, like a tremendous lot of things. Like these things, each of these things is much larger than the Earth's atmosphere. And so it's totally conceivable to me there's not two but three or even more. Because the, the other thing is we know almost nothing about what happens below the lowest cloud deck, which is totally opaque to everything but tiny windows in the infrared. So this, this stuff, I'm almost certain, will reflect stuff that happens above the cloud decks, which it, is itself just a tiny fraction of the Venus atmosphere. Like the cloud deck, the lowest cloud deck is at like 45 kilometers. So <laughs> everything below that, we don't know anything. Other than apparently at the surface, it's extremely calm. So um, the other thing that can happen that, again, we know almost nothing about is really bad weather. So there's this climate problem where you want to be like moving appropriately. But there's also this problem of basically just storms. And this shot, if you Google steampunk airship on Google, let me tell you, there are some fantastic images. This is one of them. There are literally hundreds. Artists have done like so many crazy things. But this is just a shot basically illustrating like, you know, you're hanging out in the atmosphere and then you become part of some like tremendously bad storm. It's not going to be good for your colony. And because we know so little about weather on Venus, we really have no idea. Um, there's actually still an open scientific debate about whether Venus even has lightning. They still don't know. Everyone thinks that there should be lightning. We've never managed to observe it. So either it's happening in the cloud decks and we can't see it, or it doesn't happen, or it happens in a way that's different than the way it happens on Earth, and so that like the, the ways we've been looking are inappropriate or something, who knows. But weather is one of those big showstoppers, we know so little. The only way really to learn is going to be to send probes that hang out in the Venus atmosphere for months on end and just monitor what happens. And they got water, they got water vapor there, right? There's 20 parts per million water, which is not a lot of water. But there is an enormous amount of um, sulfuric acid at basically the same kind of levels as we have in our clouds. So that's what the clouds are. And it should support lightning in the same kind of way. But the, the weird thing is because the cloud decks are so very, very far from the surface, there can't be surface strikes in the same way that we have on Earth. So what they suspect for the lightning is that it would be cloud to cloud only. But again, they've never observed it. No one knows whether it happens. Just up. Oh, what's the temperature change? Do they know what the temperature change is? From where to where? Where When it goes up to the atmosphere. So the, the temperature profile, I actually have a slide for that. The temperature profile is basically like super hot at the surface and, and decaying kind of exponentially all the way to the outer atmosphere. It doesn't even have a troposphere in the same way that Earth has, where you know the temperature goes back up again. Venus doesn't have that. But, I mean, the, the, the absolute temperature change is absolutely enormous. Like at, at the upper reaches, it's negative 100 C, and at the surface, it's 452 C. So there's an enormous temperature change. But again, the distances in the Venus atmosphere are so huge that like it's not a lot. I think if you do the math, it's something like 10 degrees per kilometer is what it changes, which is not a lot. Well, it must have lightning, I think. We 
because lightning is the discharge of the energy. So you've already got when you go from ice to to uh, water to water vapor. So it's when it changes state. Yeah. So and when it, it goes and the back, sulfuric acid is totally changing state all the time. In yeah. fact, it like it rains from the cloud deck, and then it falls to the point where the sulfuric acid basically boils, and then it returns. There's this continuous cycle on Venus. So this is what I'm saying. Scientists believe that lightning should be happening. We just never managed to observe it. So it remains a mystery. Um, and then, of course, there's an enormous number of unknown unknowns. Um, again, we just need a lot more information. We need to send probes to Venus. We need to have a lot more science done. Because inevitably, there's going to be challenges. We have no idea what they are. Um, which brings me to the Venus Society. <coughs> Yay! So um, this is actually the Mars Society. All I did was strike out the word Mars and replace it with the word <laughs> Venus. <laughs> <laughs> Which made it super easy to come up with a mission statement. <laughs> but I mean, it would basically be the same thing. The idea basically is to advocate that we should explore and settle the planet Venus. And we might add the word atmosphere here, right? The atmosphere of the planet Venus. But it, it would be basically the same. And it would be citizen scientists such as yourselves who think that the idea is super cool. And we have, what was that the next slide? Yes. There would be some kind of annual conference that you could go to chat with people, present papers, there'd be some kind of colorful journal that would get published, um, it, there would be public advocacy where basically you lobby NASA and the CSA and the ESA and the Indians and the Chinese that we should do missions to Venus. Um, there would be research coordination, trying to get funding for scientists, and there would be lots of fun design work, which is my final interesting slide. This is designed by my friend Quinn. Um, we've been talking a long time about what a Venus colony would actually look like. Um, obviously, there's an enormous number of possibilities. All you really have to do is have some kind of container that holds air and um, is closed, and then theoretically there needs to be some way to land the spacecraft on it or dock with the spacecraft in some way. So this is her idea. It's, um, we talked originally about the idea we wanted to have the colony be able to move so that you could avoid the weather or you could follow, like I said, the climate thing. You could like fight the Hadley cells or whatever it is you need to do. We wanted it to be able to move. And so we started looking at underwater creatures, thinking that this would be a good way. Because it's not, we don't want to be bird-like. We want to kind of be more mellow. And so one of the ones we found that is super awesome is the manta ray. And the idea here is basically the colony would somehow be able to flex those wings in order to like move along relatively slowly, you know, 10, 20, maybe 30 kilometers per hour. And then there's kind of a landing port at the front. This would be some kind of gigantic airlock that you could get big things in and out of. Um, she said this is a satellite dish. It seems awfully large given that this is the scale of a person, but maybe you need such a thing, I don't know. And then inside, you're basically growing all of your crops that you need to survive. Your housing can be in here. And then um, in the underside, one of the really cool things about Venus is there's almost as much sunlight on the underside of your colony as there is on the overside because the cloud deck below you, that third layer of clouds, is so reflective that you get an enormous amount of basically diffuse sunlight coming back up. So her idea is you would cover the bottom of the colony with all of the solar cells that you need in order to get power. So you got sunlight coming in the top of your crops, reflected sunlight coming in the bottom for your power, and then you're trying to make a go of it. Um, there were a lot of other designs that we considered. I'm not going to show you any of those, but like, really I feel like there's an enormous design opportunity. One of the things that this does not accomplish that was on our hit list is that modularity idea that I talked about. How, how does this manage to dock with others that are like it? How, how does this manage to create another of itself? Even if it's capable of making the raw materials, right? say all of the materials that you see here are some kind of plastic, that you can manufacture by extracting stuff from the atmosphere. How do you make another of yourself if this is what you look like? I'm not sure that it's possible with this design. Maybe you could do it, but it would be cool. So anyway, lots of design opportunities, some really cool thinking. And the thing that I love about it most is it is not a gigantic bunker under 16 <coughs> feet of Martian soil where you can only come out for two hours a day. <laughs> This is a place I would actually like to live. Yay! <laughs> so with that, that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to take an endless number of questions or show you any of these slides again. Thank you.
Um, when you're um, when you're looking at Venus, you see the photographs of Venus in the cloud deck. Which uh, which cloud layer are you seeing? You're Is seeing the third layer. The third layer. Yeah. The, the first lower, two layers lower. are relatively diffuse. You see mostly the third layer. Yeah, I, I came a little late, so you may have covered this. Uh, did you talk about the, the day night cycles? And yeah, oh, yeah. So um, if I go back, I can show you. The planet itself has um, a day that's 116 days long. It rotates very slowly, um, only slightly faster than it goes around the sun, which is why the day is very, very long. But the atmosphere actually rotates around the planet very quickly rotates at about 350 kilometers per hour. And so if you're hanging out in the atmosphere, like 50 to 55 kilometers, you're actually moving around the planet at about 350 kilometers per hour. And that means that you circle the whole planet in 96 hours. So your day is 48 hours of sunlight, followed by 48 hours of darkness. Um, and like I said in this slide too, the speed of the atmosphere has actually changed while we've been watching it. It's been getting faster. Nobody knows why it goes at all. Nobody knows why it's getting faster. But it's likely that your day on Venus will actually change in length on a regular basis. This looks like it probably goes up and down. But, but it will never be much longer than that, presumably. <laughs> Since nobody knows why it rotates, nobody can guarantee that it won't That's stop right. rotating. But <laughs> um, Have you made any consideration, or would there be uh, any reason to consider going down to the surface, maybe get some materials? So, so there is, in, in Jeffrey Landis' original paper from 2003, he actually talks about this crazy idea that um, you would have basically a, a long tether with a scoop at the bottom of it. And the tether would actually have balloons. Every like couple kilometers, it would have balloons to hold up its weight as it goes down. And then at the bottom, you'd have a scoop, and you would basically be like dragging it along the surface at 350 kilometers an hour and going like... <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, you would haul the scoop all the way back up, harvest, and then you lower it all the way down. I personally think that's crazy. Um, and there are other schemes, um, Jeffrey Landis doesn't talk about this, but other people do, where you would basically have some kind of airship, which is capable of going all the way to the surface, scooping up some stuff, or landing and grabbing stuff, and then taking off again. Um, presumably they would be unmanned, because I don't think I would want to subject people to that kind of danger. But it's conceivable to me you could design a spacecraft that could tolerate temperatures and pressures down there for several hours, long enough to scoop stuff up and bring it up. And it, as long as you weren't planning on building in metals, if you just needed like a few, you know, a few pieces of metal for things, or you need the iron that, that we need in our, our system, or the potassium, or the calcium, or whatever, I think you probably could mine the surface in small quantities that way. It's way more conceivable than the scoop, in my opinion. <laughs> But I think it would be easier to do it from space. I think the near Venus object is the best idea. The um, rotation is the uh, through the pole. Is it is it offset like Earth, or is it where where is that with respect to rotation around the sun or the sun? To, so I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, the planet itself spins so slowly that you could basically ignore that. So the real question is about the rotation of the atmosphere. And I don't know. All the diagrams I've seen, like that one at the end, show it basically being like right around the, the spinning. But that doesn't necessarily mean it is. I don't know. Good question. Because that would be a question about the climate, right? Yeah. Because yeah. on, on Earth, that the offset actually causes our winters and our summers. I don't know what the situation is. I don't think is Venus has a tilt. Yeah, I don't think it does. I've never read that it does. I don't think it does, but I don't know. Well, it would, uh, yeah. 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 I mean, on Earth, the reason it exists is because the, the planet itself is so tilted, right? Yeah, but um, also, it changes all sorts of other things, like the Corollas effect and that, you know. With, yeah. With, yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know. I, again, because we don't know what causes the super rotation, I don't, I don't know. Good question. Has there been any um, terraforming studies done to try to um, eventually make Venus, um, you know, the Earth's twin uh, planet, um, habitable in, within a few generations? Like, like on the surface, you mean? Uh, um, ultimately, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I, I've read some amateur speculations to that effect, but 
the truth is that all, almost all terraforming projects are of a scale that is just absolutely mind-boggling. Um, even small changes to the composition and size of the atmosphere will take millennia. Um, you just have to witness the efforts we're making here on Earth. Like the, the level of industrial activity that's required to change our atmosphere by parts per million, which we're doing with CO2, is just absolutely phenomenal. Our entire civilization basically adds three parts per million on Earth's atmosphere, which is like a tiny fraction of a parts per million on Venus' atmosphere. If you wanted to remove the CO2 down to the level that like we have here on Earth, on Venus, I think it would take tens of millions of years. I, I just think that's the way of it. Um, what I would like to see in terms of the terraforming is that, that idea I had, where's my, this thing, the idea that I had that maybe you could cool the temperature of the atmosphere by a few degrees. You only need maybe 10 or 20 to make it a little more comfortable for us. And the way that you would do that is basically just erect some gigantic mirrors in space, something super, super thin that stretches for you know a few hundred kilometers in diameter, such that you can reflect away a few percentage of a few percentage points of the sunlight that hits Venus, and hopefully cool the atmosphere. Obviously, it would take a while. Again, that's a project that would probably take decades or hundreds of years to actually achieve its intended effect. But I, I, at least you're not dealing with like you know trillions of tons of mass that you're trying to do something which is the problem with changing the composition of the atmosphere, or changing its size. Yeah. Um, um, there's an interesting, uh, on the terraforming front, have you read the new book by Neil Stevenson? He has a new book called Seven Eves, and he does, maybe it's not that No, it's a different story. So anyway, but I read a short story where basically they're using asteroid and comet impacts on a planet in order to change the atmosphere. That is a faster way, but it requires like hundreds of thousands or millions of impacts. And I don't know, that's a way, they've talked about that for, for Mars, where you would basically just like collide lots of comets and try to get more water and build up the atmosphere. But again, that would require just an enormous presence in space. I mean, you would have to have a lot of robotic spacecraft that are like redirecting comets from all over the asteroid belt, and it would take a long time. Can we trigger some volcanic activity um, to try to blow away some of this atmosphere? <laughs> yeah, I mean, just like on Earth, the volcanoes aren't nearly strong enough to get things out of orbit. Like, you need to blast it much further than that. Are there uh, any uh, interplanetary uh, probes? Or are there any spacecraft going to be in the same time soon? Or yeah? so, so there are, um, there is a Japanese one in orbit right now. It actually just achieved orbit in December after a five-year delay where they, they failed to achieve orbit in 2011, and then spent a whole lot of time basically like circling the sun in an eccentric orbit, and reconvened with Venus, and they're now, they're there now, and I believe that it's designed to observe the atmosphere. Um, um, there are two missions in the running for Venus in the current um, NASA program. The one, um, I've forgotten what the name of the program is, but Discovery. It's, it's the yeah, it's the Discovery program. It's the cheaper program where they only give you like five hundred million dollars or something, which seems like a lot of money, but it's a standard pretty small. <laughs> but yeah, there are, there are two in the running for that. One of them would examine the atmosphere, and the other one would examine the surface. Um, and they're competing against four other proposals for one slot. So, in, in a naive way, you could say there's a one third chance that there will be a new Venus mission from NASA. If it does launch, I believe that launch window is something like like 2022 or 2021 or something like that. So the scientists have a few years to make it. And these are lar largely atmospheric exploration? Mm -hmm. are they um, so, so like I said, one of them is an atmospheric exploration thing, and the other one is basically like a super enhanced radar one, where they have, it actually has some kind of more advanced radar with a secondary radar that allows them to peer at an angle or something so that they can basically get a lot more detail about the surface of Venus. Um, they're hoping to learn things about the volcanism and stuff on the surface by learning stuff in a lot more detail. So from my perspective, only the atmospheric one is interesting, but... <laughs> so there's no active uh, orbital spacecraft right now? So th there's the Japanese one. That is the only one. Um, up until about a year ago, there was a European agency one that did a lot of atmospheric work, actually. We learned a lot about the atmosphere, but the only one in orbit right now is the Japanese one that just achieved orbit literally a month ago. Um, and they have, it's also, 
it is not in the orbit that they wanted because of that, the weird delay. So they're only being able to do science something like one twentieth of the time. They're in this like super elliptical orbit. But they are, they do say they're still going to achieve about 90% of their original mission objective, which is going to take longer. What, what happened to the European one? Uh, the European one completed its mission successfully and deorbited. They, they basically, they, they orbited for something like six years and analyzed the atmosphere endlessly, and then um, they ran out of fuel to keep boosting its orbit. And the, the final thing they actually um, burned up in the atmosphere of Venus while they pointed telescopes at it and looked at that for like the final piece of science. It's, it's done now. It's so, a cool mission though. So there was, there was enough um, uh, atmosphere where it was orbiting that they needed to boost yeah, it? Yeah, they, they were low enough that they were boosting it. I mean, it was still pretty high. It was basically like where the International Space Station is, but much higher because it's on Venus. So it didn't require a lot of fuel. I mean, they did have a six-year mission or something like that. So they got a lot of good science in. But yeah, there's a sad lull. It used to be, um, when the Russians were doing it, that there was a new mission to Venus every, well, every every launch period, which I have on here somewhere. It's like every every year and a half or something like that. Here it is. Yeah, every yeah, eight over five years, which is about a year and a half, they, they launched almost every launch opportunity. But we haven't been doing that recently. All the attention is on Mars. Just a really nuts thought that you had that one bar, that height. Um, if you were, if you were orbiting at that for a long period of time, would that actually sustain at one bar? Because I'm just, this, this is nuts going through my mind, but I'm just wondering whether it would start to change, you get, you'd start measuring above from that fixed point and how that would interact with where you were from the surface. So whether you start measuring from the fixed platform, so you get different pressure on it as it's stabilized in time. Yeah, Does that make sense? I don't think that I understand your point, but I mean, the, the, if you think of a helium balloon here on Earth, um, the helium leaks out, and the air leaks in. And there would be a similar problem with balloons on Venus. Um, obviously, we would design some kind of material to make the leak as slow as possible, but part of what a colony would have to do is be continually regenerating the you know, air inside it so that it maintains its buoyancy at the level that we like, so that we can maintain it the altitude that we like. Now, what I'm on about, the bar is created by the total pressure. Yeah, from the bar is basically created by the altitude that you're yeah, at. Yeah, exactly. Above so I'm point. just wondering, if it was a fixed point, then you actually start measuring, if you call that a zero, then would the actual pressure, how would the pressure change? Because you're measuring from here to here, and then you put it in here. And I'm just wondering whether you'd actually get a different pressure building up from this point upwards. Does that make any sense? No, no. no sorry. Think like, so like on Earth, if you're at sea level, the atmospheric pressure above you is not constant. Um, that's why we have barometers, right? It changes yeah, yeah, due yeah. to the weather and the climate. And I think a similar thing would happen on Venus, right? Due to weather and climate, the size of the atmosphere is moving. And what would actually happen, because you're buoyant, you would actually move up and down in height in order to maintain the pressure. Yeah, that's what I'm on about. That's yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, right? but if you fix it, then you... S if, if you were somehow able to fix your... Yeah, that's what I'm on about. If it yeah. was fixed, it would start changing the pressure you're receiving as opposed to moving up and down and... Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, but that's not going to happen because you have no way to fix your altitude. You're not actually connected to the ground. What instead will happen is yeah, okay. your colony will move up and down with respect to the surface yeah. in a way that's hopefully imperceptible. I mean, this gets back to the climate question that's a showstopper. If, in fact, the atmospheric pressure changes so rapidly that you're going to experience turbulence as you move up and down to maintain your um, your pressure, then that's going to be a showstopper for the colony. Yeah. But again, we don't we don't know enough about the Venus atmosphere to know whether that's going to be a problem. So my question did make sense, but looking at the fixed point of one bar, yeah, 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 yeah. then if it was there, then you would change. You yeah, would change right. your altitude. Yeah, okay. Hopefully not. That was the question. Right. I didn't phrase it right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Something about um, the biosphere I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, here on Earth, um, we have found living organisms at the edge of um, the um, Earth's atmosphere. 
at the deepest points um, of uh, the oceans, you know, the highest pressures, yep. um, deep inside the ground. Um, also living in acidic environments and all so on and so yeah, on. Yeah, extreme so files. So um, would there probably be a biosphere similar to the Earth's um, that would have conditions right for the same type of living organisms that are so, found here on Earth? So people have speculated about whether there's life on Venus in a similar way to how we speculate about whether there's life on Mars. Um, it, it comes down to really this same question about um, climate this thing. You say, say there's some kind of organism that like floats around in the atmosphere, right? The question is whether that organism can follow a path that doesn't result in it sinking so low in the atmosphere it gets sterilized. Because you only have to sink a little bit for the temperature to rise so much that no extremophile is going to survive. Nothing can survive, you know, 100 degrees C that we know of. I mean, maybe Venus life is different. But it, it certainly seems to me that if, if it's going to regularly be part of you know, a Hadley sum or something, and the depth that it sinks to here is such that it, it is exposed to um, too much pressure and too much temperature, life would probably be impossible. But it, it doesn't strike me as impossible that there is some kind of zone that life could like kind of hang out in where life could survive basically indefinitely. Um, the, the other major problem is because it can never get down to the surface, it really doesn't have access to a lot of the kind of um, micronutrients that we're used to life having here. So it has the nitrogen, it has the carbon, it has the oxygen, it's got sulfur, but it doesn't have potassium, it doesn't have calcium, it doesn't have iron, it doesn't have any of the other like trace elements that we need to survive. And so if you're going to conceptualize a life on Venus, either it has some way of obtaining these things or it doesn't need them at all. And I frankly find it difficult to imagine that it it doesn't need them. I know enough about biochemistry to know why it is, for instance, that our red blood cells have an iron in them, and why it is that we need, you know, potassium and, and um, calcium and these kinds of things. And I just can't see how you could design any kind of biomolecular replicator that could exist without some of those trace elements. Admittedly, at parts per million levels, but that's the kind of levels that are just not available in the Venus atmosphere. So there's that problem, and there's the climate problem. I don't think it's impossible. I think it is kind of unlikely. I think it's more unlikely than that there's life on Mars. It would certainly uh, capture the public's imagination. Right? It would, I agree. Because right it now, would. Venus seems uh, to be ignored by the press and everyone else for some reason. Yep. Right? That was actually my Venus. question. Oh, yeah. right? You've made a compelling case for Venus, but Mars gets all the love and the money and the missions. So yep. it's a bit of an open ended question, but you know, I. But you want me to read about why, why, why it is? Yeah, so there's. There's this video that I mentioned right at the start. Sorry. No, it's okay, because I, I didn't talk about this video a lot. But um, he has a, a piece in it. It's a seven-minute video, and there's about a one-minute piece where he rants about why it is that Mars gets all the attention and Venus gets none. And he coins a term which he calls surfaceism. The idea, basically, that humans could only live on the surface of the planet. If you believe that, you have to go to Mars, because there's no way that we can live on the surface of Venus. And we have no desire to live on the surface of the moon, we can't live on the surface of Mercury, and so on and so on. Basically, if you want to live on the surface in our solar system, Mars is basically your only bet. So that's one reason is it's just it's much easier to conceptualize living on Mars. It's going to be more similar to the way that we live here, bar the fact that it has to be an underground bunker. But some people live in underground bunkers, right? <laughs> um, so. In general, I would say that's probably the big reason. Um, the other reason is, I think, that um, it's easier to tell the Mars story, right? Because it's so, because of the surfaceism, it's easier to tell that story. And it's been told for much longer. And now, the, the other reason is, obviously, the Mars story has been building for decades. The Mars Society itself was founded in 1996 or 7 or something like that. And even before that, there was a lot of excitement for Mars. They'd had probes around Mars. You could see the surface of Mars, even from Earth, using a telescope, because it's always in the night sky at convenient times, unlike Venus. And so Mars has just had a lot of building time. They got the rovers and so on. And I mean, I think that Venus would be an easier target. But convincing people of that is going to be the job of the Venus Society. It's why the Venus Society needs to exist, because 
I personally think it's a lot more compelling than going to Mars in terms of a long-term option and like an actual enjoyable living experience, but it is being ignored. Nobody talks about Venus, that's the quote. I, I went through the whole video. This was the quote I picked from the video. <laughs> Nobody talks about Venus. How much of a gravitational disadvantage is it? Venus is closer, more in the inner solar system. More in the inner solar system? Um, not substantial, I don't think. Um, there, there is, one of the advantages of Mars is it has, because of its lower surface gravity, it's going to be easier to launch spacecraft off of Mars. And Venus will have a problem. The other, there's a, you can look online. If you want to launch a rocket out of the Venus atmosphere, there's a kind of a problem. Because where exactly is the rocket, right? And people have devised these really elaborate schemes where you have like a, a torus, like a, you know, a donut. And then the rocket is kind of suspended by strings in the middle of the torus. And then you launch the rocket from that like air, flat air pad. <laughs> Again, this is one of the problems of surfaces, and right? there are some advantages to actual surfaces. Because you're not going to want to launch your rocket from the small pad on your colony, which is filled with, it's basically made of plastic, because that's what you have. I'll talk about the gravity well of the solar system. Yeah, the gravity well of the solar system. I, yeah, I don't think it makes any difference. Like I said, it is, um, it is quicker to get to Venus from Earth. That's really one of the only things that matter. The other thing that matters, you're closer to the sun, so you have a little bit more solar energy. The sun is something like 50% stronger on Venus. Um, so that's an advantage in some ways. You have better solar power. And a disadvantage in others, there's a little bit more UV radiation and stuff like that. But I don't think in terms of gravity well that it particularly matters. Um, one of the interesting facts that I read, and I don't know how this can be true, but I read that actually the, um, the delta V to the asteroid belt is smaller from Venus than it is from Earth which is weird. I guess it's because you're going faster. I don't even know why. Anyone understand that? Is that the delta V from the orbit of which one? So yeah, or? yeah. From, from Venus orbit to the asteroid belt is lower than from Earth orbit to the asteroid belt, even though Venus is further. I don't, I don't really understand that, but maybe you use some sort of tra transfer past the sun. Maybe? I don't know. Oh, well, the orbital velocity. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know why that is, but I don't think in general that it really matters that you're deeper in the gravity wall of the sun. Um, oh, one last question. Oh, one last question. Yes. Well, uh, this is uh, a follow-up of what we were talking about. Um, in, that, uh, in that paper written by, I think, Landis, uh, it shows a diagram, and it actually shows that um, the flight path from a rocket uh, to the asteroid belt is actually shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, so know. maybe that explains why the yeah, density yeah. is lower? Yeah, but I don't know all the details. I didn't study it very closely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Eric. It was a wonderful talk. Uh -huh, you're very welcome. There's some copies if you want to ask as well. Eric is here for a little bit more, I can believe. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm just going to make this up because I think it's the best slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm happy to hang out and talk. Oh, also, I should mention. This wonderful outfit is made by Wendy. She has a fashion line called Distropolis. It's very spacey. It's made in <laughs> Venus fashion. This is what we're going to be dressing like. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to stop my recording. <clears throat>